Hi, Christina. Welcome to the Let's Talk Yoga podcast. Hi, Aru. I'm so happy to be here with you. You know, not many people know this, but I have been practicing asana with you for a year at this point. Um, and I practice with you every week. We practice virtually. We do live close by Bellingham and Seattle. It's not, not really that far apart. And I've I've told you this before, but I'm going to say it to the audience out loud that I've really enjoyed your, you know, your um, high caliber sequencing and the instructions you put into cl class and virtual classes are, in my personal opinion, harder to teach than in-person classes. And, and you put so much attention to detail and humor. I think that is what I think is really special, apart from all the good stuff. Uh, and, and the way you use your props and stuff like that, your your yoga education and experience really comes across. And the other week, last week in class, you mentioned something about four different kinds of instructions. And that's what really got me thinking on this conversation because I was like, I have to have Christine on the podcast for the past year. I've been thinking about it. And I was like, so, but what are we going to connect on? Because there is so much we could connect on. So mostly yoga teachers listen to this podcast. And a lot of asana teachers, and you know this, they struggle with instructions and communication in general because it is challenging to put what we feel into experience, into in a logical, coherent sentence that makes us relatable uh, and engages them in the process of just learning aspects of yoga. So now that's a really long intro. I usually don't do such a long intro, but <laughs> to kick things off, in your opinion, what are we as yoga teachers or asana teachers trying to achieve by giving instructions? Because we're not going to be able to get people to enlightenment in an asana class, right? Or really? ourselves for that matter. <laughs> See, this is why I love your classes. Uh, <laughs> it is so... and, and so what are we working towards as yoga teachers and as trying to instruct? Where are we going with it? Wow. Well, you know, the longer I've been teaching yoga asana since 1998. And I think in 1998, I would have had a much easier time answering that because I would have been very certain about what we were uh, doing. And so the longer I go about teaching and mm -hmm. my own understanding develops, and also right alongside that, the industry, if you will, has been changing. Mm -hmm. So when I started, my teachers were very clear what they were. I started in Iyengar yoga. And many people have heard my story about this, but that was in 1991. And I didn't pick it off of a menu. It wasn't like it is now where you go, I mm -hmm, could take mm -hmm. hot flow and I could do flow with music, but cold flow with music. And yeah. <laughs> every very little um, you know, niche is represented, if you will, in the marketplace and all of that's fine. Uh, but I didn't have the burden of having to make a choice. It was, there was one yoga teacher, she taught Iyengar yoga. That's mm -hmm. what I learned. And I'm very happy I learned that way. Um, and truth be told, I probably at that time in my life, if there had been some kind of super fun flow with really great music and a hot, sweaty uh -huh. <laughs> situation uh -huh. and cuter clothes, I probably would have done it. <laughs> Oh yeah, uh -huh. I had to go in there wear those bloomers, and it was, you know, a lot of strict uh, protocols for class. So um, yeah, so that's a little bit just about my entry point, which informs, I think, how I see things. And if you're saying mm -hmm. other yoga teachers are going to be listening, and their entry point is gonna is going to influence how they hear what we're talking about. And so when true. I started mm -hmm. doing teacher training, at some point, I realized I was talking about yoga classes with this type of start stop instructional practice mm -hmm. um, was what you did at home classes where you came to learn. And that's in my background when I'm describing a class, but if I had someone in my class, we were using the same words to describe mm -hmm. yoga class, but they were hearing it through the lens of their experience, which is increasingly vinyasa oriented these days. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so why did I, you're speaking of the long uh, tangential opening. There's my long tangential answer to your question, which isn't even an answer yet. But that I knew when I got started, one my teachers were teaching so that we would learn to practice at home. Mm. They weren't interested mm -hmm. in providing mm -hmm. a 90-minute 
yoga experience, although in that 90 minutes, by the time we focused that hard, worked that hard, started, stopped, looked, Mm -hmm. learned, listened, got upside down, got it all happening as best we could, Shavasana was always really quite wonderful and the effect Mm -hmm. of yoga happened. So it didn't mm-hmm. happen in the same way as I, what I think is a common trend in the uh, yoga now. So I am using that as an example to say that I think there's many things that we might be doing. And so as a yoga teacher, through our instructions, we might be mm-hmm. um, explaining, we mm-hmm. might be just reminding students of what mm-hmm. they already know, but just need, oh yeah, that's right, kneecaps up. Mm-hmm. And then in even to zoom out a little bit, when I talk to yoga teachers, some are very interested in fostering community. And mm-hmm. some yoga teacher, teachers are very interested in helping students have a strong physical workout, if you will. Other mm-hmm. teachers are really interested in providing a more centering meditative type space. And so mm-hmm. what it is that we're up to, I think also there's shades of the same thing or maybe facets of the diamond that we'll say yoga asana. Mm-hmm. but highly variable. And so mm-hmm. um, let's say in Ashtanga Vinyasa, I mean, in some of those pr- uh, traditional practices, A, it's silent, no one's saying anything. And then maybe yeah. one mm-hmm. step out, they're actually more like a metronome. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. keeping the count and keeping the breath. And, yeah. Yeah. and it's just basically calling the pose name. So one of my ways to answer your question without answering it too specifically is to encourage teachers who are listening think about what it is that they want to accomplish when someone's mm-hmm. in their class. And I mm-hmm. mean a little bit deeper, most of them, I want people to feel better because that's the answer I almost always get when I do teacher training with people and say, well, you know, what is mm-hmm. your aim for the yoga class? And 95% of the answers come in the first round of that questioning and student and the mm-hmm. teachers and training say, I just want people to feel better at the end of the class. But I'm saying pull a little bit deeper and say, well, how, how, mm-hmm. how does that feeling better come? Cause you learned something mm-hmm. new because you did something new because I said nice things to you or like, how does it happen that we yeah, feel better, yeah. you know? So mm-hmm. then that starts, I think, to inform the intentionality behind a class. And then that I think has, when the intention is strong and clear, then mm-hmm. what we say and how we say it, I think follows from there. So mm-hmm. if I mm-hmm. teach a flow class and there's music in the background, I don't say nearly as much as I say in a, in an average alignment oriented class, because Mm -hmm. a student would have to listen to me, listen to the music, listen to themselves. And I don't even try to do the same kind of teaching. Mm -hmm. It's too much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No. And no, I really appreciate that because I know a lot of these questions we'll get into uh, is challenging to answer. There is no, it's not black or white. And uh, that's why I was like, if, anyone can have this conversation with me, it's probably you. Um, And so essentially something I like to go back to is, is in these conversations with teachers is usually focus on more than focusing, focusing on how you'll teach, keep the focus on how they are learning and lean into that a little more. If you notice, if you give them say prop work and a little additional cueing on that, if that enhanced their practice, lean into that a little more. I think what happens sometimes for at least newer teachers, uh, it happens to everyone, but more so for newer teachers is we're lost in our own heads and it somehow becomes all about us and surviving the class and coping and all the nerves. And you know it, right? I don't even have to finish that sentence. So um, I think it is, it's, it's going back to what you were saying, you know, there is no one answer for this. And you have to see what is working for you. Lean into that a little more. But is there something such... So there are two categories the way I see it, Christina. There is over-instructing, you know, where you're just uh, going on and on and on. And it could be high-quality stuff that's really making a difference. Sometimes it's just word warming because we can be uncomfortable with silence. And... Uh, and then I also have been in classes where it's under instructing, where the class is not engaged at all. Um, and so how do we strike a balance? Is there a balance or how do we not fall into this trap? I mean, these are really badly formed questions at some <laughs> level, but, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky topic the way I see it. And I think that, yeah, I agree with you. I, um, 
one of the things I think that you really were hitting it, um, getting really close to it is that I don't think that instructions in terms of cues, if you will, or verbal instructions mm -hmm. were really ever designed to carry the whole yoga education, even, even yes. else, mm. certainly not the whole of yoga education, but let's mm. say even the asana education, which is pretty immense. I mean, if we look at, we're learning the postures, we're learning body parts, we're learning Sanskrit names, we're learning, mm -hmm. you know, actions within the poses. There's a pretty big content on this seemingly physical practice. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then add to that, you're having some kind of very strong emotional unfolding that's mm -hmm. happening inside each student and inside the teacher. So I always tell new teachers, you know, get from the opening ohm to the closing ohm without having a panic attack. And you alluded to uh -huh. that. So we're in agreement with that. Uh -huh. That's the first year's task. First ohm, yes. mm -hmm. you know, and then layer into that, get people into and out of the poses. And mm -hmm. so then you can start to layer in, I think, more nuances. And so my uh, thing, when I think about the instructions, I, I think about my, my own experience as a student. And I had teachers that had lots of rapid fire instructions and um, lots of information to share in the, mm -hmm. and very wise, wise, wise teachers, long practiced. I was considering my yoga background as we were getting ready to meet today. And I was thinking I would have been in my late twenties and my teachers were in their late forties. So they mm. were so much further along in everything. They've been going to Pune, mm. India to study with Mr. Anger about as long as I've been alive. About the time I was in kindergarten, they started going yearly to see him. So the gap between what they knew, what they could do, what they could read, how they could read a room and me I just always listened to them. I had no trouble with that. I thought they know more than me. And mm -hmm. fast forward now, we have so many people new on the path of yoga teaching, which is, you could probably have a lot of podcasts already done on that topic. And the upside of that, I think, is I've noticed as a trainer, if I tell someone to straighten their legs, sometimes they get defensive or their feelings get hurt. But if I tell uh -huh. them, this is how you help your students straighten their leg. <laughs> Then they get their yeah. notebooks out and they're real interested. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. one of the mm -hmm. good things about people getting into the path of yoga, I think, or at least one positive potentiality is that sometimes uh, it calls us to a little higher knowledge and a little more accountability. That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. It does not happen across the board, clearly. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, we can learn more about our understanding, what we understand and don't understand when we're trying to put words on it for someone else. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. one thing I have noticed with almost every new group of teachers that I've trained over the years is you go from having this bodily felt experience to whatever degree we have it integrated in ourselves through practice and then standing up in front of the room. And like you're saying, trying to put words on that. And this thing mm -hmm. that we know so intimately when we're now trying to give that in terms of a instruction for somebody else, it can feel like, you know, leaping across the, the Grand Canyon. <laughs> Like, how do I do true. that? The gap between my yeah. internal experience and what I'm able to say is so vast. So, um, so in terms of that, this is just a little bit contextually in terms of my answer. I think that when I'm a, in a student as, and I understand the language my teacher is using. Mm. So I know 95% of what they're saying, even if it's kind of rapid fire, lots of information, if I understand it, I can keep up with it. And I know mostly how to do it. Then even a lot of quote unquote over instructing will settle my consciousness and give me a ride to get on almost. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm on your ride. Mm -hmm. And it can be a lot of words, but it doesn't feel extraneously mm -hmm. because it's speaking so congruently to my interior experience. So mm -hmm. it can have a quality of that chitta vritti narodaha. You know, it can have that mm -hmm. quality of it's a lot of words, but my mind is on it, my body's in it, and I'm I'm in a I'm on a ride. Now, as soon as I know don't know what they mean by what they say, <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's two instructions or ten. It feels like mm -hmm. an interference. Mm -hmm because I'm, mm. I'm confused or I'm lost or I yes. missed something and I'm in anxiety and I'm in my self-critical mind or I uh, feel like I'm running behind the train rather than riding the train or the train's running mm. over me. You know? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. So, um, and what you really hit the nail on the head, I think, was when you're saying, how do we know we're looking at our students? 
-hmm. If we're saying straighten our arms, so I think instructions, no matter how good they are, the context of them in every teacher training I've ever attended is you give an instruction, you look to see to some degree if they're doing yes. it. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it, the, yes, <laughs> so true. And then I think of it in my mind like a flow chart. Straighten your mm. arms. Oh, well, look at Is, that. Are the arms they, straight? Mm. Are they are or did they straighten their arms? Yes. Okay. Next instruction. Then move on. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, mm -hmm. why not? Do they do they think that they're straight, but they aren't? Mm. Are they too tight or too weak or too unaware? Is it just too mm -hmm. hard of a work? You know, so sometimes mm -hmm. I think the reason why we're not doing something is it's not right for us, right? Our student is exercising agency. They have a condition mm -hmm. or an injury mm -hmm. we, we mm -hmm. might not know about. Sometimes they think they're doing it. <laughs> it's an awareness yeah. issue, yeah, but so they're true. not. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they can't. Maybe my sequence hasn't mm -hmm. prepared them or maybe their body just isn't at the stage yet for that. Mm -hmm. And then there's mm -hmm. plenty of times I have a lot of students who are fiery types, of course, since I am. And they're, they're going to work really hard, but there's just as many students who it's just, they don't see like, why should I straighten my arms? Like, what's the relevant? They don't what? see the point. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they don't see the point of it. Yeah. No, I hear you. And, and uh, I also think how engaged a student is, is partly the responsibility is just their own. Like they, the amount of interest the student shows up with will determine the quality of work they put in. Uh, but I also think partly that responsibility lies with us to, to figure out how to engage the student. And to communicate in a way where we're able to grab their attention, even momentarily. And yes, the mind will go in and out, in and out. There was something you said um, in your answer that that I want to just pause on because I feel like it's central to what we do as yoga teachers is you were talking about just higher knowledge and accountability. And um, I've always thought that the quality of yoga education we get really determines where we'll end up as yoga teachers. And because you've been teaching for so long and you've had exposure to a certain group of teachers uh, or certain types of teachers, it has clearly impacted how you teach and your approach to yoga. Uh, and you've put in the years, the decades, right? But now we are in this fast food type of yoga world and it has, it, it has its advantages. I'm not going to beat up on it. Uh, but it is... Do you have any advice or suggestions or just anything that will help teachers who are in this where who are in this you know place of everything is so fast seems so fast because of social media and digital uh, work in yoga it just feels like they have to get from that start point to that end point in a very short span so what if someone has not had exposure to high quality yoga education or teachers, they have the sincerest interest and they just haven't found their way to the right sources. Do you have any advice in, in terms of just improving their ability to instruct or even learn yoga? You can extend that into learning yoga. You're asking hard questions today, Aru. I, um, because, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think we all, um, one of the things that took me a really long time to notice or really get was that no matter how someone came into yoga, it's the thing that hooked them and it's the way mm -hmm. that they, that they fell in love. Mm -hmm. It's like, and I used to have much more of a, this, uh, just stronger opinions around what was quality and what wasn't quality. And so, um, I have to interrupt I, you there to yeah. say me too. <laughs> Me too. Okay. And, and yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that because I know what you're talking about. I've been there. I've had those conversations with myself and other people too. I mean, I completely get it. I, I remember teaching an, an Anusara yoga immersion at a power yoga studio. And this is when it started to dawn on me because in my background through Iyengar yoga and Anusara, which came out of so much of John Friend's you know, expertise from Iyengar yoga and um, we always thought that the flow practice was an advanced practice before you're going to string things together with movement. 
Mm-hmm. You needed to know the component parts of the posture. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so we mm-hmm. can see all of those old footage of BKS Iyengar and his students doing jumpings and moving through quick practice. So mm-hmm. it's not absent. Flow and movement is not absent from alignment-based yoga. It's To me, it's just an order of operations. Your entry point is the shapes and the positions. And mm-hmm. then you string those together if you're going to for various reasons intentionally. So... I always considered vinyasa practice much more advanced <laughs> because you didn't know what you were doing before you were just thrown into the pool. But then mm-hmm. my a host who owned the studio that was hosting me, she got into yoga through flow practices and she had a lot of problems with anxiety and depression. And it was the heat and the movement and the challenge that got her out of her mind a little bit to sink Mm -hmm. into her breath and her body. And she said, I really would have had no way she told me, could I have done, put your big toe here, put your outer heel there, do all of those intricacies in the beginning. I would have, Mm -hmm. it would have made me more anxious, not less. And that's where Mm -hmm. I started. That was over 15 years ago, probably that conversation. So I've been considering this and I've seen it when I show up to teach someone who doesn't know me and hasn't been taught how I teach. I'm the new kid on the block. So I think I have more expertise, (laughs) but Mm -hmm. let's say someone, I have this experience more than once. I, uh, my I had a student who was managing a yoga studio in Austin, Texas, and he really wanted me to come on board on the faculty and, you know, sort of do the thing he liked that I did and sort of help change the culture of that studio mm-hmm. towards more refined quality yoga education. But so when I go in, I'm teaching my class, I'm, I got to get to work. These knees aren't straight. I got to help you with your arms, yeah. you know, <laughs> but like I go over to the student and I'm getting ready to say something about how to help her knee. And she goes, I have problem knees. I'm like, I know, <laughs> I know because that's what I'm helping you with. I, but uh-huh. let's say for five years, no one helped her with her knee. And mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. unconsciously, if no one has helped her for five years, she might think, I don't know what I'm doing. Because if the yoga she's paid good money to learn and spent her time and that she's time, fallen yes, in effort. love with... Mm never addressed that, but this new kid on the block who she doesn't know from anyone, even though I've got my bag of tricks from my supposedly, you know, superior yoga Mm -hmm. education. (laughs) Uh, Mm -hmm. It's not that she's going to necessarily get it right away or be able to recognize it as more quality. It might be. So I do think that that process of growing into studentship and growing into increasingly refined layers of understanding, whether it's in our practice or in our work as a teacher and where those two things touch up against one another. I do say that that's a process. Um, Mm -hmm. And I also do see that um, I agree with you in this sense that there's a quality that the student has to bring and a quality of interest and presence and openness and, and tapas and those kinds of things. And yet when teachers tell me that their students don't want to learn, I keep thinking, but you're their teacher. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. Because this is a common complaint in modern yoga. Oh, the students, they just want to get in, get out, do their flow, and they don't want to learn. And that may be, but we're their teacher. So have I really done what I can do to inspire Mm -hmm. someone to learn and Mm -hmm. why it matters? And that's going to, of course, make it interesting. And of course, that's going to take time and unfold over time. Mm -hmm. But also, Mm -hmm. I get, I walk into the room with a basic assumption that people would like to learn, even if they mm-hmm. don't know it yet. And that most people would rather be a little tiny bit better today than they were yesterday. Like if you could, if you mm-hmm. could get better today, wouldn't you want to? <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. No, totally. <laughs> now, I don't think uh, that that's true for everyone. I mean, I'm not in charge of that. But if I start feel when I start feeling like no one wants to learn, and no matter what I do, it's not working, then I start thinking about a different job. Because mm-hmm. Absolutely. No, that's very, that's a very important point you bring up. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I do see though that we might, um, we're making jokes and, and trying to keep our, you know, opinions in a little bit of check and be polite and that's good. So we're teasing ourselves about our superior thinking and, and our growth around that topic. And um, one of my meditation teachers, Paul Mula Ortega, he suggests that we don't contrast uh, good and bad or contrast mm-hmm. good and right, good, like right and wrong but we learn to contrast superficial and deep. And so Mm -hmm. I do think that we might have fallen in love 
with asana at first sight, however we did. <laughs> you know, yep. maybe it was on mm-hmm. your paddle board. I mean, there's a lot of ways to get involved in yoga and get into a relationship True. with it. And then there's the recognition that while many, many people's lives are changing for the better in and through whatever they're calling their yoga practice, there's still not everything is the same and not everything mm-hmm. offers the same quality of depth. And I think the biggest mm-hmm. thing that by starting in Iyengar yoga is my teachers, they were so be um, dedicated to their studies with Mr. Iyengar that the teacher-student relationship, I think, is very traditional coming out of mm-hmm. the Indian culture and mm-hmm. um, being so referenced in, that's why I kind of think old, the old school. And there's, of course, problems with that too. Um, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But they were senior teachers in their own right, and they were so reverential and respectful mm. to their to their teacher and to each other's uh, evolution and growth. And so that was just mm. my doorway in. It was never mm. um, I could just always see that that there was so much more that met the, than was on the surface. So maybe my advice is if you could have a little um, if you're saying, oh yeah, okay, superficial and deep, I do want to grow. I can see that I've gotten this far and there's maybe something else to get. Mm-hmm. then I would start to say, well, where is, where, what kind of depth are we looking for? You know, like depth of, cause there's, you can go deep in a lot of different ways, whether it's anatomy, pranayama, deeper into the philosophy, deeper mm-hmm. into meditative practices, deeper into the art of mm-hmm. instructing. And I think when we start to recognize a hung, hunger for depth, which sometimes comes because we recognize we don't have it, <laughs> mm-hmm. then that hunger is the key, you know? And, and then, mm-hmm. then I think, how can you not find it? But I know that it can yes. be hard to find. No, it, it, it's, there's, there's no correct way to, ha- like not even the correct way, there's no one way to have this conversation because it's just so vast and so intricate, right? But there are a couple of things I want to go back to here. Um, and you were talking about superficial versus deep, right? And I think two qualities that yoga teachers need on a constant basis and more so when we're teaching in any capacity is you want to have reflection and reverence as two things at least that's I personally keep an eye out for and um, and constantly going back to because I have so much reverence for this practice uh, reflection is a non-negotiable and because I reflect reverence goes up and they kind of feed off of each other and it, it strangely, it, it, it helps me get more uh, clarity and it helps to go back the next day and do the same thing. I mean, think about it. We kind of say the same things in class and we, the same, at least I peddle the same jokes over and over again. Like, because uh, unlike you, I can't come up with new stuff. <laughs> so, no, <laughs> you I, know, I recycle uh, a lot of material. <laughs> you know, so uh, I just tell them jokes are part of their package deal and that's kind of how. Uh, we go about it. But but on a more serious note, I think um, we have been in, w- when we were taught yoga in, in some ways, out of good intentions, we got stuck in queuing and instructions. We overlooked that communication is a part of instructing. Like instructing is a part of communication, right? We only think it's about how to do the pose and it ends there. But there's more to it. And you do this beautifully. You communicate with your classes, right? And you're you're very present. But I think where a lot of asana teachers, yoga teachers get stuck is they just think it is about how to do a pose. But that's one part of it. There's more human interaction. That humanness has to be part of it where the instructor is relatable. I don't think there's a question here. Uh, But just when we show up to just be human, in class uh, while still giving them a professional experience of what they're there for. And I think that's kind of overlooked, just getting stuck in queuing versus just overall move queuing into communication. And I like to say, I'm giving you context and I give them a little bit of context, nothing too, too deep or too vast, just give them a little bit of context. And then if they seem curious, I will go back the next time and give them a little more context of why we're doing something or how we're doing it or some history bit. But, um, but to realize that communicating is, at, is more important than just giving a list of cues that you wrote down and not really seeing what's happening. Amen. And, you know, 
when I started teaching, we didn't even use the word queuing. So it's very interesting. I always get a little like hackles go up a little bit when I hear the word uh-huh. queuing because we were, we didn't, that's kind of a new word on the scene in the last. It is. I don't even remember it until maybe five years ago, four or five years ago. I and mean, I'm, English is not my first language. So <laughs> when I moved here, I used to listen. So, I mean, I I can speak fluent English, but but compared to you've heard how you heard our Indian British English versus here and it, my biggest learning curve when I moved here a decade ago was as to go to classes and I used to be like why are they saying it like that there's a more direct way of saying it and I remember I used to come home and tell my husband I'm like people use fancy instructions here and I don't know if I like it or I have a problem with it and it took it was my way of figuring out just the difference in yoga culture here versus India and f- sorting through who I resonate with and who I don't. But um, yeah, no, there was a learning curve there. And yeah, queuing and I think is something that, that's new to me. And I think that, you know, when we're taught in, um, I think, you know, the early levels, it's about the position of, you know, starting like in the Iyengar Yoga School, we would talk about going mm-hmm. from the known to the unknown. So get to know where your feet mm-hmm. are get to know what wide stance means, get to know the shape, get to know your body in that shape. And then I always make the analogy, I understand what you're saying correctly. I make the analogy, like all of that is like the door to the temple. Like mm-hmm. it's decorate the door, mm-hmm. the shape of the pose. And then there's, okay, well, then we want to open the door and we want to get inside the structure. And mm-hmm. that's that reflective mind of do something, feel something. And and then my experience with a lot of my teachers was maybe there was some very nuanced detail, but they were much more interested in facilitating what was happening interiorly in the pose through all of that alignment. Mm. Not that the alignment just was about an ever increasing list of do's and don'ts. It's in service yes. mm. to the mm. interiority and to, for me, a language of response and of a, Mm -hmm. okay, I now know how to feel inside the pose. And I think it's one of the biggest misunderstandings about alignment oriented yoga is that the outer shape is what it's aimed at. It's Mm -hmm. the outer shape is in service to an understanding, I think, and a relationship with our consciousness. And so I think that first layer of practice about almost like learning the alphabet of the asana Uh, And then if teachers are there in their practice and that's what they're keyed into and learning and their teachers there, and then it just becomes sort of um, just a misunderstanding that we're all just staring at the door to the, to the temple, (laughs) not like inside where the worship is happening, where the, where the, you know, revelation might, might occur in terms of practical tools. You know, I spent hours in early teacher training with here's what, here it is. You, you can save yourself several thousand dollars. And this is what I teach you in 200 hour teacher training, verb, your body part in a direction. That's all you need to know. And someone says, how do you cue verb, your body part in a direction, <laughs> like stretch your arms up, <laughs> straighten your leg. <laughs> so maybe you don't always have the direction, but uh, you can add a breath cue, inhale, straighten your arms over your head. <laughs> so uh, to me that that is um, one of the most, if I, I may be a little bit too extreme of what I'm about to say, but I think if yoga teachers could learn to talk people into and out of poses with verb, your body part in a direction and with a somewhat of an economy of words for the action, then we would elevate the level of yoga education tremendously with that alone. Active commands, active voice. Instead, we say, like you said, weird things like left leg steps back and you, and now I want you to and you're going to keep doing this and if you feel like it and if you want to and keep the integrity and meanwhile, celebrate the fullness of your heart and uh, jump back into Chaturanga Dandas. And I don't know, I mean, I mean it's, all, it's all in there together and most of which is just fine. It's just a lot of it is not immediately relevant. So, and I listen to movement teachers from different disciplines. And um, when I sort of tease people about how verbal instructions are given, no one thinks they do this, but I had had listened to people who they 
there's no complete sentence ever. It's coming to the front of your mat, bending forward, extending your spine, stepping back. <laughs> it's like one ing word after the others, or there's no someone. Someone I was listening to someone will say left leg does this. Now you're gonna and. No one thinks that we don't think like we talk like this, but if you were to my secondary assignment would be record your class easier than ever now with Zoom and really listen. I give people in my teacher trainings a worksheet about common tendencies of verbal instructions and you make a mark about when did you use active voice? When did you use that passive voice where leg steps back? Your leg doesn't step back, not on its own. You know, <laughs> you've got to step your leg back. And um, some of that's, you know, uh, English bias in terms of language doesn't work with Italian or something like that. But um, so we all have little habits we get into. And so I um, think those two things are some very practical tools for people wanting to get clear in their instructions is to really, really listen to themselves teach and say, what can you cut? What can you cut out that's meaningful? I mean, that's that wouldn't. So less is more, even though I'm super chatty type. Oh, wait a minute. I've lost you. Oh, wait, you're muted. I don't know why you're muted. Okay. There we go. Sorry. That's because uh, like I told you, my contractor is working <laughs> on the deck. So I'm trying to like keep the sound yeah. quality going. Uh, so what I was saying is, you know, essentially what we all have our personalities and I'm, I'm for keeping your personality when you teach. Don't try to be somebody you are not. But at the same time, you can't bring your entire personality into class because you wouldn't be, uh, you know, doing that in another professional environment. You would be aware of where you are and what context you're dealing with people in. So I think essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying short, crisp, clear, to the point, don't try to go somewhere where, you know, people are lost, like where, what was the original intention of what we are up to here? Um and I also like to add on that, think of the students' listening capacity. They're probably coming to you tired, you know, mentally tired or physically tired. May not always be the case, but I notice people who walk into the studio, they come end of the day, they're done. You know, they want to be told what to do, how to do, when to do, and they want to be out of there. They'll feel better, they'll be out of there. So just keeping that in mind, I think is very important. And I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, and so how... How does one distinguish between, is there a difference between teaching a beginner and a more experienced student? Because there are nuances for, for both. So how does a yoga teacher figure out if they are ready to step into teaching more experienced students? Uh, or should they teach beginner? Do you think one is harder than the other? Well, on the upside of teaching beginners is, they haven't heard all of your jokes yet, so they'll think you're funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and they'll think it's very impressive that you can touch your toes. You know, you don't have to impress them yeah. by busting out handstand in the middle of the room or anything so like true. that. <laughs> so true. Uttanasana is enough. That yeah, too, uh, like... <laughs> 60% Uttanasana is enough. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'll Easy tell you please, that yeah. I think beginners are a joy to teach and harder probably to teach. So mm -hmm. I do think that for the newer teacher, an experienced set of students is typically a little, maybe intimidating on the one hand, but may have some advantages. I would also have maybe. a caveat in terms of, for instance, when I used to practice at this wonderful Bikram Yoga Studio in Austin, Texas, and every year or so, that was before they had their kind of collapse, they would have a group of teachers go to the um, you know, California, wherever their teacher training was and spent, I think it was a nine week training or something like that. And then they would come back and they would be on the schedule learning to teach. And after nine weeks, and in that system, 26 postures, same order, two breath exercises, mm -hmm. and they have that, what they call that dialogue, which they That's actually good, told yeah. me, side note, that that dialogue is exactly what you and I've been saying. It doesn't seem like it's a dialogue because there's really only the teacher in the front of the room. But mm. one of the things that one of my uh, friends who teaches Bikram and trains Bikram teachers said is that it's a dialogue because the teacher is saying something and the student is answering back with their bodies. 
And that's what makes it a dialogue. So just to kind of reiterate that point around what you were saying and what we've been saying is like, how do you know if it works? You're looking. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, if your students are in the shape that you're hoping for, then it's a sort of an effective instruction, even if it's over, it's under, mm-hmm. if it got the job that you wanted it to get done, active voice, passive voice, ING, whatever, if they look like they're in Vera yeah. 1 and you said Vera 1, nah, you know? Okay. <laughs> I mean, on one level, mm-hmm. on one level. No, no, I get um, it. Yeah. But um, so, but when those, when those people would come back from their nine weeks, they were not very good, but they were stepping into a room of people who already knew that sequence. And, and the sequence mm. was if they didn't have to be good to move the group through it. And, mm, mm-hmm, and then in mm-hmm. six weeks, they got some mentoring at that student. It was very professionally well mm-hmm. done in terms of their teacher education component. Once they got out of training, they still had support at, and mentors at their studio. But within six weeks, they were great. I mean, they weren't as good as the longtime teachers who could deliver the dialogue, help someone with a more advanced mm-hmm. expression and deal with an injury at the same time. They weren't mm-hmm, as good as that, mm-hmm. but they were proficient. And so they mm-hmm. were going to get better by doing that same thing over and over again mm-hmm. and um, keeping the variables fairly small. So mm-hmm. I do think that that as a beginning teacher is why it would be easier with experienced students because they're going to do those 26 postures or flows mm-hmm. like a Shunga Vinyasa flow, same flow, or even in the mm-hmm. Baptist system, they have some skeleton, those journey into power sequences that are reasonably consistent that this new teacher might come into a studio where most of the people knew the routine already. That'd be a very easy way Mm -hmm. for a new teacher to get started, even if they were a little intimidated. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's not everybody's situation, of course. And my experience of advanced students is they're also pretty easy to teach because, um, you know, they already basically, you can say, close your eyes, go inward, and they all know how to do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might have your breath that you do that. Someone else might feel their sitting bones on the ground and somebody else Mm -hmm. might, you know, do something in terms of repeat a mantra. Different ways of grounding. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And centering. And yet someone had taught them all those discrete methods. So by the time they're more experienced and I say to you, go inward, I've done this as teacher training. I say, well, how would you do it? And everyone Mm -hmm. had a similar and different ways that they were, that they described. If I Mm -hmm. give that simple instruction, whereas the beginner, you have to teach them how to go inward. (laughs) Yes. It's harder. It's much harder. (laughs) And tools. like And before that, how to sit. Yeah. (laughs) Right. How to sit and then take all that into account. And then, yeah. Yeah. So um, what to me is the hardest group of people to teach is the picky, what I call the picky experienced yoga consumer. (laughs) And so this is someone who has experience and has proficiency. Mm -hmm. And they're very, and what has happened over time is that their preferences are highly, highly magnified. So they know what they like. Mm -hmm. They know that they have a little bit more, it's a stage. Some people never get through it. Some people never get to it Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. where it's like, I want my latte half calf, one and a half pumps of this, but a half pump of that. And could you heat it to this degree? Because their tastes are actually quite refined by this stage of practice. And they, they know it works for them. They know it likes Mm -hmm. for them and they're not doing it on their own. So they're now wanting you to cook the meal for them, (laughs) but they're really Mm -hmm. picky about Mm -hmm. the food they want to eat. I'm mixing metaphors from Starbucks. But wouldn't that also make you rigid? (laughs) Rigid? (laughs) Wouldn't that also qualify as being not flexible and rigid in some so. way. But I'm telling you, okay. I've seen the student <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. And whereas my advanced students, um, one of my yoga, yoga teachers, he used to say, in the beginning, he's in the beginning, you are holding on to the student's hand and you mm. are holding on to yoga in your other hand. Mm. So in your left hand, you've got mm, the student's beautiful. hand and in your right hand, you've got yoga. And your job with mm-hmm. the beginner is to get the student to mm-hmm. hold on to yoga themselves. You want to get out of mm-hmm. the equation where you're the, the link. And he, the point that he made about that was that then you're free to teach them more of the subject. It's not all going mm-hmm. through you because the student's now interested in the subject. Yes, and more than interested in you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And no, then, one, my... <laughs> Uh, my main, one of my main teachers always in our graduation speech, I remember he said this and I've been repeating it ever since in all our graduation speeches and beyond that, uh, 
you know, how do you stay on the path of yoga? And he, he said, you follow the yoga, not the person. And if you keep your eye on the yoga, the, then you will never be off track. You don't follow the person, just keep following the yoga. And that is where you should be. He said it in his own simple way, but it was very profound. And till today, I tell, tell myself, like, follow the yoga, not the person. And it's more relevant in our day of social media and how our popularity metrics work. And that's a whole different conversation on its own. Uh, but that's exactly what your uh, this person said. Connect the student to yoga directly and move out of that eventually. And I think and that's you beautiful. know, I've been blessed by... Um, some really wonderful teacher-student relationships. Mm. I was going to say that I've been blessed by having great teachers. And the truth is that those same teachers who were great for me have some mm. wreckage behind them and they were not great teachers for oh, I others. Bet. So I, bet. Mm-hmm. Um, I I'm, don't have the best language for that, but I'm practicing saying that those teachers-student uh, relationships that I have had have been quite profound, not without their complications, mm-hmm. but but I've benefited a lot mm. from from the people who have taught me. And so, and the, mm-hmm. um, and there have been, to me, there's really one of the beautiful things as a yoga teacher is being part of a relationship with someone's relationship with yoga and being able to be in service mm-hmm. to that and being able to be a witness of watching the person go from the beginning series to still being around 10 years later. And one of uh, the other reasons I would just encourage people who've started a teaching is, um, is to stay with it is because that to me is one of the most interesting things about teaching over the long haul. Isn't that mm-hmm. I'm like become some perfect person, but it's that I can really feel the continuity of, oh, we've been at this, some of us for 25 years together mm-hmm. and through pregnancies, divorces, deaths, poor choices, mm-hmm. great fortune, yeah. tragedies. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then the yoga's there and we're there with the yoga mm-hmm. and, and all mm-hmm. of that to me is um, so much more interesting than verb your body part in a direction. Yeah. At the same time, the asana class is held together by that structure of what we say and what we don't say. It's a verbal tradition. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Like, it is. It is a verbal tradition. Right. It's an old yeah, tradition, yeah. you know, and um, the Upanishad, right? To sit down near the teacher. So we were going to sit down mm-hmm. near ourselves. We sit down near the teachings and that, you know, and the idea of following the yoga. And so um, I do think that it's less intimidating for many people to teach beginners circle back to that but I think it's harder in a lot of ways and it's also rewarding is to be part of uh someone's beginning steps on the path is really quite beautiful and maybe they stay with Mm -hmm. us and maybe they don't but most of and that's okay yeah most of us remember our first yoga Mm -hmm. teachers and experiences with you know various whether it's good or bad (laughs) we remember (laughs) but I think a lot of what makes anything you know I think I think it really is going to vary as like what, Mm -hmm. when you're getting, when you're starting out teaching, you know, what circumstance are you teaching in? And yes, I think that's a big factor. Yeah. And one thing that is great when you have beginners is they have no preconceived notion about what it's all about. So you get to be the one blank slate. This is how it is. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. And, and that with that, you know, there's that, that, I think it was Batman. I could be getting my movie references wrong, but with great power come great responsibility. And, so with beginners, I feel like we have twice that responsibility because it's a blank slate. And what you and I say is yoga is what is yoga to them. And to me, that's a very heavy burden. I think it's a burden I carry joyfully, but it comes with like, oh, I have to check myself uh, because they for a lifetime, I'm, I'm assuming lifetime, will assume what I have said about yoga in my own broken way is what they will think of it. And they'll only get as much as they can possibly pull out of that based on their experience. And they'll tell 10 other people what is yoga in their own ways and in their own experience. And maybe it gets watered down, maybe. And then the person perceiving that will have their own, you know, thing to add to it. So I think it's just when we say beginners, we just got to realize that it's a blank slate. And why to me, that's exciting, but it also makes me a little nervous. Yeah, you know, and I, I have to check that, myself. I'm thinking about why people always ask me about beginners and they say, well, do you do the chant and how much you can't teach philosophy to the beginners? And first of all, you know, we've talked about this online before. It's, you know, I'm primarily an asana teacher, you know, so mm-hmm. I, me too. Um, that's what I'm doing. That's why we're here together. You know, we're talking about asana mm-hmm. classes. 
But I don't wait until someone's been practicing for five years to tell them that this comes out of a deeply, yeah. profoundly spiritual, philosophical, mm-hmm. religious tradition. And that doesn't mm-hmm. mean that's going to happen on Wednesday night at 530 when the class is called flow, but I'm going to be able to really mm-hmm. cover that. But I don't, mm-hmm. I don't say like, when do, when do you think it's good to let some, well, they're not ready for that. How do you know? I mean, I don't assume. How do you know? Yes. In, Someone's a new mm-hmm. teacher. Someone's a new a new student. That I mean, they might be have a sitting meditation practice. They might have had profound, you know, research into their own deep inner workings in ways that I don't know about. I've met students like that. Yes, you know, like a few <laughs> weeks ago, I had this very devout bhakti yogi show up for an asana class, and. Uh, And after class, I had that conversation with him about, I'm not sure this is what you are looking for. Because he was clearly, he he spoke to me about his experiences, what he's reading, what he's been exposed to. He's at the ISKCON temple six days a week. and, And I was telling him, then why are you coming to a studio to do an asana practice? Is that because, you know, again, Dukkha Nivriti, right? Removing suffering from the body. In through asanas. And so is that what, what you're looking for? If yes, then this can serve you. But if you're looking for bhakti yoga, we're not, I'm not the right fit, you know? And uh, it was a great conversation because it's, and it takes, initially we think, right, everybody has to love us, everybody has to love yoga, but, and everybody has to love the way I'm saying it to them. And getting over that, getting over ourselves. And, you know, I always tell myself, get over yourself. And and I think that's very important to recognize. Yeah. And so I feel like that that is, uh, to me, I always want to give back to the reverence issue, reverence that there's a larger tradition, but I'm not mm-hmm. necessarily, I'm really aware of the limits of our ongoing mm-hmm. open, you know, public asana instruction. Yes. And what's, and what's possible in and through that. So... I do think that we can, um, and I think that we can speak to it and I can speak to it without, and know very clearly, I'm not necessarily facilitating that, you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can get, they relate. I mean, I feel like many, many facets of the diamond of yoga, to use that metaphor again, you know, there's a lot of mindfulness, of course, in the asana instruction. There's a lot of pranayama in asana. There's a lot of all of these wonderful components, Mm -hmm. but it's still not for me the same as seated meditation. And it's mm. certainly not the same so as uh, mantra, and it's still not the same mm. as whatever you know, sort of ritual or devotional practices that might bring a kind of quality of depth and faith into into being. And so, to me, I, I mm-hmm. feel like it's good and healthy to go. Okay, I'm primarily an asana teacher, and I want to have some reverence and respect about the tradition and acknowledge that there's more there, and I may not be able to get to the to the more. You know, like, mm-hmm. and uh, no, no, and, I hear you. Or to be able to have to recruit somebody to it, you know, I'm kind of like, I don't mm-hmm. know, maybe someone's got that handled somewhere else in their lives, and they're they're coming to stretch their hamstrings and get a little stronger, work on their balance. You know, mm-hmm. I I had I'd always tell people that I just uh, why someone's in my class, I don't really consider much of my business. Correct, I mean, and, and you can find class, that no judgment. Yeah, I mean, I have my opinions. I'm super opinionated. <laughs> But really, this is not my. But business. you're not judgmental. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not. You're not judgmental. I've been in classes where the teachers are judgmental. Yeah. Um, and I've removed myself from those environments because I'm like, no, that is not not for me. Uh, and I, so, yeah, opinion judgment. I feel like judgment's more harmful to the student. You know, or just that someone can't draw. You know, grinding an axe. I've been in so many classes where the whole teacher's pitch is, you have to go inward and you have to do these things. I'm like, I'm interested. I'm doing it. I mean. <laughs> Yeah. I sold your, I believe you. I'm into it. You know? <laughs> it's so, not a hard sell. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think that we're in, um, you know, I also want to have a lot of compassion for myself and all of us who are endeavoring mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. share any little mm-hmm. piece of the vast tradition. That's kind of how we, I got on that little rant was that we we're talking about. Yeah, I've got the beginners and we're opening up the door of yoga. And so I want to tell you that we're doing asana. And I want to tell you that there is a meditative tradition here and that this isn't where you're going to learn it, but there's that that will bring this alive. And I want to tell you that mm-hmm. there's that there's all of these things, but not necessarily that it's going to happen. And I and that's not going to happen in one class either. But I, I mm-hmm. uh, want people to know that there is an invitation through this tradition for something that's just a quite profoundly, extraordinarily awesome. 
I mean, there's a technology that we're stepping into a living stream of that's Mm -hmm. really, I think Mm -hmm. it's timeless and it has the capacity. I don't think my Wednesday night yoga class is the only ingredient here, but like we're, we're even in a very small way on a thread, I think that connects into something very deep, very rich, abiding and important. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. at the same time, most people in yoga class aren't necessarily wanting some big heavy handed sermon, you know, they've worked a full day. (laughs) Yeah, I get it. What you have capacity (laughs) for. Yeah. 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 And I mean, I think that I don't, someone doesn't want to and I always think of it's an invitation, those deeper rungs of practice. Mm -hmm. And I say deeper, Mm -hmm. not because they're better, but just because the surface level of the body position is, you know, inextricably linked and not necessarily the same as the deeper levels of the being that the process is aimed Mm -hmm. at. Mm -hmm. But it's all coming together as part of the game. So at the same time, it's, it's when it's the beginning yoga series, this is what wide stance means. And so we have to teach people the language. You got to start somewhere. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I, I like to think of it on, and I want to be respectful of your time. I'll just take oh, two more yeah. minutes as we yeah. wind this down. Talk about uh, this all day. That's uh, what we do. <laughs> I know. And, and, uh, and I'm looking at my questions and I'm like, okay, part two, we'll wait for some of this stuff for part two. But it comes down to just, you know, in the corporate career, if people are into corporate careers, there's an entry level. And then over time, you slowly grow up and into wherever you want to go. And it's the same in yoga, whether you're a student or you're teaching it. There's an entry level. And then you go through your own stages. And some of us, we fire ourselves along the way out of that system. And, you know, and and that's fine. And people leave jobs and some people leave the practices. Uh, But it's completely, you don't have to ever feel forced to stay on it. And you don't have to force others to stay on it. You put it out there who want to take it. If they're ready, they'll take it or they'll leave it. Uh, And I feel like knowing, just realizing that makes it less about us in some way uh, and more about just the practices there for whoever wants it um why am i telling you this no real reason honestly uh well, you know one thing but, to me that i really always want to just remind myself i remind the teachers i train so i can remind your listeners and <clears throat> you know no one is forced to come to our yoga classes mm. you know and we're not mm-hmm. forced to go to anybody else's you know so absolutely i always think that if someone has a bad experience. I would, I don't want that, you know, but there's a lot of places mm. to go learn some yoga. So if something I'm offering isn't your cup of tea and there's plenty of people yes. for whom it's not mm. their cup mm-hmm. of tea, so there's probably a yoga studio down the street or just a different zoom. Mm-hmm. I see that too. Mm-hmm. There's where you can find that sort of thing. And so it doesn't, I sometimes feel like there's a little bit too much pressure out there for us to get it all right and to be all mm-hmm. things and try to make it all everything. And there is the, I want to connect the student to the yoga. And it's not about me. And then there's also, I have a way that I'm probably going to do that most reliably. And, Mm -hmm. but that's just more consistent and and congruent with me and my personality and my way. And so Mm -hmm. that's going to work for some students and not work for others. And, Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't have any magic formulas for that because sometimes I can really love someone. They really love me and it's not, we're not a good fit at a particular time for what I'm offering and what they feel like they're wanting and needing and that can't be forced. But I do think that um, it's really up between people and their own, their own, you know, that deep self that's got them like, what happened? I sometimes think about this, like what happened that someone got on the path of yoga and what my, my guru one time was in a giving a talk and, and we were reading some text and it said something about, you know, good karma and having good karma. Someone asked a question about this big topic. Topic. This is not our podcast topic, I know. Uh, <laughs> but he said, y'all, <laughs> he might have said you guys because he was from New Jersey. But he said, y'all, you tend to think that a good karma is going to be that, you know, you're winning the lottery or you're going to get a better mm, job. Mm. The good mm-hmm. karma is that you found the teachings, that you yes. have a teacher. Mm that you mm. have the capacity to consider those things in, in a meaningful mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. You have zeal and interest. Manorma, a uh, Sanskrit uh, mentor, she'll say, um, one thing you can't give anybody else is thirst. Mm. So you know, true. the student mm-hmm. has to be thirsty. And so once someone's thirsty, then things unfold really different. And I don't mean chronically mm-hmm. unsatisfiable, but just... Oh, you start to feel there's something there. There's more to be had. 
And that as a thread, I think that we can really follow. And, and to me, what is it in us that's recognizing that more? That to me is the, it's like the calling card from the self. It's like, wait a minute, just the outer shape isn't it. I've got yeah. this prana inside, you know, or I've got this mm-hmm, awareness mm-hmm. of of how my big toe meets my heart and how that relates to my capacity to love. You know, those things unfolding to me are like, that's happening inside of verb, your body part mm-hmm. in a direction. <laughs> <laughs> opening home to closing home, managing our personalities as best we can, uh, being as human as we can. All of the things that we've talked about, which are plenty of, we could even spend another few hours on the techniques of those things. Mm-hmm. But they're mm-hmm. all to me aimed on like, how is it that we're in that part of us that wants more than the surface of life? Like, how are mm-hmm. we knocking on the door of the heart that says, you know, I'm not satisfied with my corporate job and my entry level experience of this vast mm-hmm. tradition mm-hmm. that's pointed at my depths. I don't want to stay on the outside of the temple. I want in. Mm-hmm. I want to be inside where it's happening, not just look at the mm-hmm. door decorations. <laughs> and then yes. and then it's depressing because yes. my heart wants that. And I go to class. It's like, your back leg isn't straight. It's totally straight. <laughs> And my feelings get hurt. And then I feel ashamed, you know, and then I want to do good for my teacher. And then they're dissatisfied. And all of the other stuff is also happening to, to, to yeah. give me chances to grow. But to me, the, to me, like any time that you, any of us are feeling that sense that there's just more than the outer shape, then, mm-hmm. then we're in the game. And then that makes me want to stay in the game more than you telling me mm-hmm. I have to stay in the game and make it into some outer prescription. You should want to stay in the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that is a generative field of energy to live in. The self is a mm-hmm. generative field. And I don't think I'm not saying enlightenment, but like the movement toward the self is a field of generative energy. So I know when I'm burnt out, I um, need rest and all those things. I'm a human being, of course, but it means I'm not in that field that's generative somehow. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. the the desire to stay on the path. It's like the nature. I mean, there's, there's forces against us, of course, inside and all the problems and obstacles and glaciers and blah, blah, blah. But, <laughs> but, like, but still the self is going to want to expand because it's expansive. Mm-hmm. So I know, I know. And when, when someone, my experience is when I get the flavor of it and when students catch the flavor of it, mm-hmm. then we've done our jobs. And there's more. Wonderful. There's more, but that's to me the thing I'm after. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. then it's going to just take okay. the time, straighten, stretch, yeah, learn, yeah grow, mm-hmm. learn, <laughs> suffer. <laughs> you, you always. I mean, I actually think suffering to some degree is, is just part of life. There's, there's all nothing life is you suffering. can. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I can talk to you all day but I know you have a class to get to. Um, there is so much I want to ask you. I'm pretty sure I will. I already know what I want to talk to you next about. I will hold off on that uh, for for a bit. Um, but as we wrap this up, Krishna, can you tell people where they can connect with you, your podcast, and anything else that you think they should know, where they can reach you? Yes, pretty much everything is on ChristinaSellYoga.com and you get access there to my online offerings and to my podcast as a link there and to workshops when I'm out and about. So um, yeah, and I'm shamelessly a, a Google search away. You'll get to, if you do Christina sell yoga, you'll get some YouTube clips. I've got a whole library of YouTube, uh, videos and, um, yeah. And yeah, but pretty much good access point is just Christina sell yoga and com. Okay. Wonderful. Of course, I will make sure to link to everything. Find you there. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been delightful. Um, And I hope to have you back. And thank you for answering all these questions that I wouldn't be brave enough to ask many people. So I think uh, that I, I think I could, I think I just effectively didn't answer any of your questions. You know, no, no, you did. You did. And these are not, these are not, like I said, black or white answers. There's so much to consider. And you put all those considerations in front of us. So I deeply appreciate it. Um, There is part one, part two, part 10, we can do about just this topic. So Thank and you. the other thing that I would just add to as a word of encouragement is that if you're a new teacher, be a new teacher. Mm-hmm. You can have hunger for more, thirst for refinement, feel quite away from the big potentialities and still have empowerment where you are to make an offering 
and then stay in the game mm-hmm. to get better. That's all we're all doing, mm-hmm. hopefully. I mean, uh, and so these two things are, are to me, keep your eye, if I keep my eye on the big picture, I also don't want to be dissatisfied about my never good enough where I am mm-hmm. mood. And yet I'm happy that there's a, there's still growth. There's still ways to improve. There's still ways to refine. And um, when I stop feeling like there are, then you see me not doing this anymore. Mm-hmm. I'll move on to something else that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. And I think that's very important to call out. Um, as always, thank you so much. Okay. It is delightful to connect with you. I will see you in class soon. Uh, but uh, thank you for doing this. Yes, thanks for the invitation.